Let's talk about deployment and tent addition and run through a whole list of fairly easy tricks that you can do to make sure that you're getting as much use as possible out of each unit's positioning at the start of the game. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're talking deployment. I thought it would be well worth updating the deployment guide video for the 10th edition of the game, just given how big a deal it is, and getting some fairly small things in deployment right or wrong could genuinely have massive consequences. Big swings in power with the potential to lose units, or have some units be completely redundant, or based on where you've chosen to put them in relation to your opponent, there's definitely a lot of scope for more experienced players getting the edge over newer players here. In the video, let's talk about the rough overview of the deployment phase, a whole bunch of things that you can have in mind while you're setting up your miniatures that might be a bit more or less relevant depending on the game or the army that you're playing, but just trying to explain a whole bunch of rules of thumb that plenty of players will have in their minds as they're trying to set up their units. First up, I think it is worth noting that given armies in Warhammer 40k can just be massively different, there's definitely not going to be a one-size-fits-all deployment guide for 40k. Each faction in the game generally wants to win the game in slightly different ways, and even within the same army, if you take a very different unit mix, you might be going for something entirely different altogether. In general, I'm not really going to dwell too much on individual factions for this one, but usually you're going to have a rough idea as to how your army wants to win the game. Maybe you're a gunline army with some durable screens to take and hold objectives. Perhaps you're playing a melee rush army, perhaps orcs or world eaters being a good example currently who just plan to th throw massive amounts of carnage towards the enemy, maybe push to table them, or at least keep them fighting within their own deployment zone to the extent where it doesn't actually matter, and you've already won the scoring game. There's all sorts of other things, and anything in between with more balanced forces, I do not go too much into detail for this, as it's going to vary for each army and collection. I think in general with any given army that I was playing, I'd want to have a sort of standard battle plan that, that you know you're going to do in the majority of circumstances, but then think about the ways that you might slightly flex that a bit depending on the opponent or how they're setting up. I think it's perhaps easier to do this and make some different plays against more skew enemy army lists, say for example if you are playing a melee rush enemy army, you know that they're almost certainly going to be coming towards you, it probably doesn't make sense to be setting up too many units right on the front lines that might give them first turn charges, and you probably don't have to make as much effort with getting your melee damage dealers to rush forward into combat, you could perhaps play a little bit more cagey with them and use them as counter charge units. On the other hand, if they're very gunliney and have got loads of things that really don't want to be in combat or want to hide away like lots of artillery, you might need to push aggressively to damage or neutralise those to some points, otherwise they're just going to rack up too much damage over the course of the game. Different enemy army compositions could really alter how you play certain units as well, Say for example if you're playing against enemy knights, anything that's only really good against light infantry just might not be all that valuable against them. So it could be those units that you use a little bit more sacrificially or as trading and screening type units as opposed to anything that can actually threaten enemy tanks which you need to try and keep safe and deliver their damage for as long as possible. There's all sorts of other variants, like say for example if the enemy had loads of deep strikers you might want to maximally spread out and focus on locking down as much of the board that they can't deep strike into. There's all sorts of ways that you could slightly tweak your battle plan, and it's worth having a look at the enemy army to start with, and decide if that's really going to change the way that you're going to set up your force and play the game, as it could definitely change the general gist of how you want to deploy your army. Before you even get to deployment, you also get to declare reserves as well, which I feel like is sort of kind of part of the deployment anyway. To me it feels like the decision where you choose to deploy your units off the board rather than on the board. Again, this might be largely part of your stock battle plan, say for example you've got a unit of terminators that you generally like to use to jump in and use rapid ingress, or you often like to use a couple of chaff units in strategic reserve to force the opponent to have to screen and maybe threaten their backfield. I'd say the biggest way to vary this one might be to look at the opposing army and how well they're going to be able to screen the board. If you're playing against something that's just absolutely hyper elite, like maybe knights or custodies perhaps, they're probably not going to be able to lock down their entire deployment zone depending on the build, and that might mean that reserves are actually extra useful against those guys as you might well be able to get them into powerful enemy units right from when they arrive. On the other hand though, if you're playing say Horde Guard or Endless Swarm Tyranids, they might be armies that just have buckets of board control, on the first turn or two they might just spread out their army so it's just all over both their backfield and the midfield, and anything that you put in strategic reserve might well be turning off in your own deployment anyway. If that's the case, then anything put into strategic reserve could actually be really quite a big mistake. You miss out on a potential valuable turn of damage dealing turn one, 
and when they turn up, they might be all the way back where they started anyway, and actually having had less movement advantage compared with if you'd started them on the board straight away. Those kind of armies could really make you use a force in a very different way. For example, I played with a Horde army against a Grey Knight player kind of recently. I genuinely think that he would have done far better against it if he'd taken the unusual step to put a few more units on the board, as they would have been making more reliable charges earlier and having better targets with all those Storm Bolters to whittle down a few more Horde bodies early. Otherwise, for things like ranged damage dealers, often people like to put them in reserve to guarantee a turn to kind of beat a strike on the enemy with good line of sight on what they need to. Sometimes it could be absolutely great to do this, particularly if, say, you've got not enough room to hide them in your own deployment zone, or if the enemy has some really big, scary, fast-moving guns that are probably going to kill them before they get to strike. But other times, if the opponent doesn't have the ability to damage them early, and the enemy isn't going to be able to hide all their units themselves, it's almost a waste to put them in reserve and not just start them on the board as if the opponent is going to have meaningful units that you can shoot with them. That's an extra turn worth of damage dealing, and if you already know that your opponent's not going to be able to deal with all the things that you've got exposed in your army, you might not really be giving up all that much. Otherwise, when you get to deployment phase, you get alternating drops with your opponent, players take it in turns to deploy units, and this feels like a bit of a mini-game with who can better de counter-deploy the enemy army, unless one player is just literally hiding all their units and things are a bit less interactive. In general for deployments, to try and conceal as much information for as long as possible, it's usually best to start with low value units and make your way towards higher value ones. Things like screens and chaff objective holders are probably best to go early. Maybe some things where positioning doesn't really matter all that much, like artillery, or things that could scout so you get a move before the game begins to change their position. And then keep your biggest and scariest threats till last, so hopefully they can have as much information as possible with deploying to both stay safe and destroy the enemy army. It should be able to tell whether or not you'll be able to keep your biggest units under wraps from the opponent until they're fully deployed. You can literally just count the number of units that both players have to deploy. And you know how many secret drops one player would get at the end of the process, and whether it's going to be either you or your opponent that gets more info before dropping their best stuff. When you're going through and trying to counter deploy the enemy, in general the game is to try and keep your units as safe as possible, while also being in a position to deal damage turn 1 and get to objectives if necessary, possibly after moving if your unit can move and deal damage well. For example, say a Space Marine Gladiator Lancer would be far better to be set up fully behind an obscuring bit of terrain, but then in a position where it could move to just tow round the corner, and know that it will be able to draw a bead on an enemy unit if it does so as opposed to just sitting kind of out there in the open and not quite fully obscured, as then if the opponent goes first they might well just be able to light it up, kind of for no gain or no reason at all. That one's a bit more relevant if your opponent does have serious firepower, which not every enemy army does. You need to gauge how much threat the enemy army will be turn 1 to your units. If you can't block the enemy from line of sight, at least you could try and get cover. It is fairly easy to get in 10th edition, just deploying at the edge of bits of terrain. Otherwise, for other options for this, you could try and pre-measure enemy units' ranges, particularly short-range stuff. Say, for example, for Eradicators and Gladius, you might know that they'll be able to move 5 inches, shoot with an 18-inch gun, but they might be able to advance and shoot with an extra D6 inches if they want to. That means you know that if you put your units just more than 29 inches away, those Eradicators won't be able to blast your tank to death turn 1 for guarantees. Could be useful for other backfield damage dealers, say trying to outrange a Vindicator tank, and if the enemy units are already deployed, you can literally see where they'd be able to move on their turn 1, and see whether or not you can deploy it out of line of sight of that movement, or out of range if necessary. You could also do some sort of element of creating bad matchups on the board, say for example if the opponent has deployed a bit oddly, say put a lot of their units that can kill infantry on one side of the board, you could try and deploy your valuable infantry damage dealers on the other side, and perhaps give the enemy infantry killing units some tanks to chew on, particularly ones that are good against infantry if possible. With good movement in 40k and things likely being a bit bunched up, there's probably only so much that you'd be able to do with that, but occasionally some units can just really counter other enemy units quite well. You might be able to deploy a melee unit opposite an enemy unit, where you know that if they charge you they'll do basically nothing, but if you charge them you should kind of ruin them. Where to put units within your deployment zone can also be something that's perhaps not quite as intuitive for newer players. In general, I just try and envisage what each unit will be wanting to do turn 1 and then turn 2. Say, for example, if you've got slow-moving, short-range damage dealers, you probably want them to be about as far forward in your deployment zone as possible, and probably kind of central as well to move towards midfield objectives, as if they wind up on one periphery, your opponent could just maybe do a bit of kiting them 
Falling back and keeping them out of range for a few turns and deal with the rest of your army before turning their attention to them. If they're stomping up onto an important objective, it's a lot less easy to ignore them. Otherwise, for units on flanks and peripheries, in general it might be better to put faster moving units there, maybe ones with longer range so they can still chip into the main fight even if they're far away. And in general, I'd probably rate that as the better place to put more fragile units, things towards the centre of the board are likely to take as much heat from the enemy army as anything, whereas things on the flanks might not be easy to engage in melee, or might be out of range or line of sight of some enemy units. For holding down your backfield, it's probably best for longer range damage dealers if you have them, say artillery or big gun tanks. If you're trying to deep strike screen, then maybe really cheap units that just don't really do all that much could be quite nice. Just having a few of those behind the main front line could be handy enough for doing secondaries and just putting more pressure where it's needed. Talking of objectives, when you're setting things up, you need to have a plan for how you're going to be taking the midfield objectives in the game and getting your primary points. Specifically for deployment, I would literally think which units are you going to move onto the midfield objectives turn 1 and just absolutely make sure that you deploy them within range where they're going to be able to do so. I think it's kind of rare that you'd have an army that doesn't want to be moving anything onto a midfield objective turn 1, as then you're basically guaranteeing that you won't get any primary points turn 2. And also having units that are a bit more forward ranging will give you more chances of doing things like tactical secondaries. I guess occasionally it might make sense to play KG if you've got a massive enemy rush army that's coming in that you think you'll be able to deal with provided you don't give them too many free kills. But if you are doing that, then you'd have to be catching up for guarantees in the later game. I think it usually makes sense to put at least some things on the midfield objectives early, ideally things that tend to be a bit tougher and a bit more cheap and sacrificial. Perhaps the ideal is that you have a really cheap unit that you don't care about too much, the enemy decides to move up and charge it with something really quite significant, and then that unit is out in the open, ready for the rest of your army just to light them up. For putting things on the midfield objectives though, I would literally pre-measure. You really don't want to be in a situation where you've just found out that your units that you really wanted to shoot with is just say one inch out of being able to normal move onto that objective. Or if you do know that you're going to need to do an advance roll to make that objective, at least make sure you know what it is. You don't want to have an advance roll that fails to get onto the objective that you've suddenly find out that you needed a 5 or 6 for, where if you deployed a bit better you could have been getting there on a 3. In general, I want these units to be the cheapest units and the most durable ones that you have. Things that maybe don't matter as much if they take the brunt of enemy firepower, though certainly some armies will just want to be walking up to the enemy army to deal damage with just enormous mighty units, perhaps big terminator blocks or aggressors out of land raiders and things. They'd hopefully be able to cause carnage while also putting presence on the midfield points. Following on from the first wave of objective takers, it would probably make sense to have at least some units following on as a bit of a second wave that the opponent can't kill, but are going to be at least somewhat dangerous in their own right. I want to deploy these units with a path of where they're going to be moving up the board. Maybe say for example, taking a fast unit and moving it into a central ruin where you know the opponent isn't going to be able to strike them. And then the next turn you can think about whether they just want to hold themselves sort of in reserve in that position, or whether they want to be jumping forward and messing up enemy units that are taking those objectives. Perhaps good examples for this sort of thing might be things like Blood Angels Jump Packs or Chaos Possessed perhaps. Somewhat fast moving and fairly general purpose things that could bully lots of lighter units out there. They probably aren't the sort of thing that you just want your opponent directly shooting. For vehicles and monsters filling this role you'd have to think in deployment about what sort of movement lanes they're going to be getting. It's often going to be a bit of a balance between taking loads of damage or trying to hide as best you can. I think ideally you'd want to have them in a position where they're both as safe as possible but if the opponent moves on to certain objectives they're going to be able to charge them getting you some alpha strike damage and also replacing an enemy objective scorer with yours. As well as the midfield objective plans, you'd also need to think about defending your home field objective, which I have been making a video on recently that should release a similar sort of time to this one. In theory, this one should be a fairly easy win, given that it's in the middle of your army and you shouldn't let your opponent take it. Probably the biggest things to consider with this are whether the opponent's got deep strikers, fast movers or indirect fire any of which might be able to threaten your home field points. You might well just have a stock unit that's normally tasked with taking that point, but again you might well be able to flex it depending on the opponent's army. If they don't have deep strikers, fast movers or artillery, you could just task a tiny low investment squad to hold it in safety if they can hide out of line of sight. If the opponent's not really going to threaten it, then you may as well have all your dangerous units moving forward to take the midfield. If the opponent's not got long-range firepower, then you could task a big gun of your own to sit on the objective while it's firing out damage. 
Though if the opponent's got deep strikers, you might need to carefully deep strike screen around it. Maybe taking extreme measures if you want to defend against a 3-inch deep strike threat, but most of the time they're almost certainly going to get somewhere and cause some carnage. Any special rules that you might have in your army, like 12-inch deep strike denial or sticky objectives, or things that have lone operative type protection, they can all be quite good for the home field as well to cause more problems. In fairly terrain-dense battlefields that 10th edition is often played on, at least at competitive levels, it's often possible for some armies to hide practically all, or literally all of their army sometimes. Again, this one's maybe going to be more or less relevant depending on what you're fighting. If you're fighting against an enemy gun line, then it could be absolutely critical to deny them as much firepower and easy kills as possible. Though if they're more melee or a bit more balanced, it might not be as all-consuming. But it's still quite nice to be able to control what they're going to be able to shoot if you're not going to lose out too much on other fronts. Hiding as much as possible is perhaps quite nice for armies that have got quite a lot of fast-moving and fairly fragile damage dealers, where you could thoroughly frustrate an enemy gun line by just hiding them all out of line of sight and jumping from cover to cover and getting the first strike on all of their supposedly mightier units. If it is important, I'd just think about your overall end deployment and how it's going to look, and what units your opponent is actually going to have the option to shoot if they get turn 1. Ideally, at the end of deployment, you want them to be able to just fire against things that are either cheap and expendable, or really quite durable to the point where you don't care too much if they're the ones targeted, at least compared with some of your other units. Say, for example, the Space Ruin Force here has tried to put as much as possible behind obscuring ruins, imagining the enemy is somewhere above this army up north of them. The only thing that's exposed in a big way are some Blade Guard veterans, which maybe aren't the worst, given that they do at least get some good invulnerable saves, and are also starting in cover as well to try and minimise some losses. Ideally, what you don't want to do, though, I think, is to basically hide almost all of your army, but then just have one really big easy win for your opponent sitting out in the open. Say, for example, if you had the same deployment here, but you just decided to put one Gladiator Lancer tank out in the open, it just means that if your opponent goes first, they are going to focus everything against that and almost certainly kill it if they've got good shooting. The difference between having that hidden behind terrain or just an easy target would be absolutely massive and could be a good 150 point swing or so if the opponent goes first. It isn't always possible to hide your entire army though, and certainly not for some armies like big hordes or maybe things like knights. So it might be a bit more of a balance if you know that your opponent is definitely going to be shooting at something. I just try and make it so that their targets they're going to find easiest to shoot aren't the ones that are most fragile and most important if you lost them. As mentioned for hiding units, I certainly wouldn't pass up on easy cover though if you do have to put units within line of sight against enemy gun lines. I'd say it is probably less important than the line of sight blocking terrain, but definitely could be pretty meaningful in reducing first turn casualties particularly for the armies out there that have very high saves. Squads can half deploy where they have, say, half their units in front of cover and half of it within cover if it makes a difference, and tanks and monsters are just ridiculously easy to get some form of cover in 10th edition, just have the corner of the tank or the talon of a monster partly behind a ruin nearby. If they're in any way partially obscured from the enemy, then they'll get a cover save, and you can do that really easily without really compromising their position very much. Otherwise, talking about screening deep strikers earlier, I feel like this is one thing that perhaps people don't quite get just how easy it can be to screen out pretty much half a board from enemy deep strikers coming down if you know that you're playing an army that just goes very heavy on them and you're likely to be having lots of their units come down that way. Even for quite elite armies, you're often just going to be able to just fully push back 9 inch deep strike on most of the board. I'd start out by making sure you've got some units in the corners, say the whirlwinds in this example here. They've been deployed to have literally measured just 9 inches from the corner of that tank to the exact corner of the board, meaning there's literally nowhere for the enemy to deploy there. And you might not even need to be that zealous about it if the only enemy deep strikers they have are kind of big units with biggish footprints. Then just as you have your units deployed, just make sure that there aren't any gaps that are greater than 9 inches plus 9 inches between units. Again, probably have some things moving down the flanks to push that out right to the edges of the board. And depending on the enemy army, unless they've got things that can teleport or jump around on turn 1, you might not necessarily need to do this kind of deep strike screening right from deployment. You might just need to put your units in a position where they can move to establish it in your turn 1, so that by the time enemy reserves can come in on turn 2, all their units are going to be deploying well far back. This could definitely be pretty game-changing against armies that need to bring units in to 9-inch deep strike, and suddenly can't do it anywhere near any of the units that they'd actually want to kill. 
against the Space Marine Army, they'd be having to shoot against the Scouts or the Intercessors on the front ranks, when ideally Deep Strike Damage Dealers might want to be trying to take out these reporter Executioners or Whirlwinds safe in the backfield. 3-inch Deep Strike could definitely mess with that, though I feel like that's kind of inevitable, and if you want to defend against that, you'd have to screen very, very tight. In some armies, that just might not necessarily be worth the investment to do so, due to compromising where the other units can go and act on the board. For a couple of specialist unit classes, the Infiltrator units are another interesting one for deployment. They're pretty great in the game in general for getting to be able to set up in a position to take and hold midfield objectives early, or perhaps threaten midfield secondaries. And potentially against the right opponent, they could do really quite big game-changing first-turn move things, like say first-turn charges against weaker enemies to tie them up and annoy them, or move blocking major units to keep them inside the enemy deployment zone. They're also pretty handy for countering and screening enemy infiltrator units as well, and stopping them or scouts getting into the midfield in the place where they've set up. As a result, usually I'd say that prime real estate for infiltration type units tends to be on midfield objectives, ideally ones where they're still going to be able to be hiding out of line of sight and not be able to be shot or killed first turn by enemy units, unless they are just very cheap and expendable, in which case you could genuinely just justify them to be a kind of throwaway nuisance if you get first turn, and not really worry too much if you do lose them on the enemy first turn. For deploying these guys, in general the order of deployment matters a bit more for them than others I think. If the enemy does have access to their own infiltrators, you probably want to put down your infiltrators about as soon as you possibly can as it might be a way to deny prime real estate to the enemy infiltration squad that might have really liked to set up in the big ruin that you've just now claimed. They can't drop within 9 inches of enemy models, so they'd have to set up somewhere else, maybe somewhere suboptimal and out in the open. If the enemy has no infiltrators, or they've already deployed them, you might as well save yours till towards the end. If you could perfectly deploy them with knowing exact positions of every enemy unit, you could just see by the board state whether or not you could set them up safe in any one place. That might help you make the risk and reward calculation for whether or not they're going to go for big first turn charges or blocks and things. For scout move units, say for example these Ab Make Cerberus Raiders, for first or second turn they kind of give you the best of both worlds as they get their pre-game move after everyone's deployed, but before first turn, you get to know whether you're going first or second, so say if you have first turn, you could use the units to push off aggressively, say you could move them out into the open and get ready to fire off any guns that they have, or move them somewhat aggressively onto midfield objectives to make the enemy have to trade units with them. Otherwise, if the enemy is getting first turn, you could use that scout move to quickly duck behind cover, that way you're not losing them for no reason, and there's just one more annoying nuisance threat for the enemy to try and deal with in the midfield. Ideally, that means that you probably want them to be placed in a position where you could do either option, depending on first or second turn. And otherwise, with deploying, you probably want them in a position where they're not going to be screened by either enemy scouts or enemy infiltrators themselves, so you'd want to deploy away from those or behind some infiltrators of your own to keep them back. But I feel like, in general, they're still a better choice for dropping kind of early in the deployment process, as the knowledge of where they are is just less useful to your opponent than most, given that they could change where they are before the game begins, so you can't just perfectly pre-measure lines of sight and things. Otherwise, and as alluded to a bit at the start of the video, you could do some sort of grand strategy for your army that's going to outplay this specific opponent in particular. Maybe a classic one from 40k's history could be refusing a flank, disguising where the main thrust of your army goes until the last drops happen, and then trying to concentrate as much of your force down one side of the board as is practical, hopefully aiming to just destroy that section of an enemy army that's deployed equally across all areas, then move on to the second half of the army in later game, potentially trying to do a bit of defeat in detail there. On the other flank, I feel like it doesn't usually make sense to just put absolutely nothing there, but it might just make sense to have some, say, cheap but annoying units to hold up the other side of the board. Maybe things like cheap units of scouts or infiltrators that could threaten to contest or control the objective that should be the safer bet for the enemy early in the game, and they might spend a turn dealing with those where you could contest before the rest of your army can swing round after destroying the first half of the enemy army to move on to the second, theoretically. In practice, games of 40k could be a bit more messy than that, and you wouldn't really want to be in a position where the majority of your army could almost be a bit kited and not be able to get into the enemy army because you've deployed them to concentrators, so it sort of depends on the speed and manoeuvrability of the opponent a bit there. Otherwise, there's all the ways that you could vary deployment and game plan. As I mentioned at the start of the video, 
You could play super aggressive against an opponent that really doesn't want your unit in their face tying them up, and you could try and make the decision whether or not you could try and push to table the enemy army by the end of the game, and make sure that you just score loads of victory points late game, or if you don't think that you're going to be able to win the damage game credibly, you could just focus on playing really cagey and hiding and scoring to have a chance of success and victory. Finally, I thought it was worth mentioning redeploy abilities as well, both in a way to help counter-deploy the enemy army, but could also help with the grand strategy sort of things that you can do. Several factions in the game have an enhancement or a commander that could allow you to redeploy X number of units pre-game, usually before the roll for first turn has happened, and then you can pick up three of your units, put them down somewhere else in your deployment zone, or put them into strategic reserve if necessary. Sometimes these abilities might not genuinely be really all that helpful, say if you've already put units into reserve that were going to go there anyway, and maybe your opponent has just hidden their entire army and there's not as much scope for counter-deploying them, but if you did, say, have a couple of really big guns squaring off against each other, just tweaking the position of your one so that it can't be shot to turn one, whereas it could move to shoot your opponent's big gun turn one, and mean that your opponent, if they go first, gets a big disadvantage, that could be pretty huge and potentially game-changing. Otherwise, you could just really disrupt enemy plans by flipping a bunch of important units from one side of the board to the other, so I've just confused them completely on where the main thrust of your army is going, maybe leave a few of their close-range damage dealers with nothing to do for a turn or two, or just potentially create confusion and kind of bait your opponent into doing some weird deployment, Maybe you have some units that are earmarks that you wanted to go into strategic reserve, say a big range damage dealer that you just wanted off the board till turn two to come in and do some heavy shooting. You could kind of do a bit of psychological baiting and deploy that on the board so your opponent will likely counter deploy it and potentially try and hide from it or line up big anti-tank guns to take it down turn one. And then just all of a sudden at the end of the deployment, you can just say, oh yeah, this isn't on the board at all. It's gone into strategic reserve and your opponent might have put a whole load of units in slightly weird places because they needed to deal with it if it was truly going to be there. It's not relevant for literally every army out there, but there are a few units with that kind of ability. In any case, let me know your thoughts on deployment in Warhammer 40k, any other tips or tricks that you've used, and if you've done any clever things with deployments that have had big impacts in the game in the past. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics, I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming, I do tend to post new ones just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that All Specs Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description if you'd like to help support. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.